All right. Well, we are right at one o'clock. So I wanna go ahead and, and get us started. Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Alyssa Vinson. I am the residential horticulture agent at the Manatee County Extension Office. Uh, we're located in Palmetto, Florida. If you have not attended one of our webinars before, um, I just want to give you a quick overview of what Extension is, and then I will let our um, Master Gardener volunteer, Amy Stripe, take over because she is our palm expert here in the office. So um, if you're not familiar with Extension, we are a function of the land grant university system. Here in Florida, uh, we work through the University of Florida. There is another land grant university in Florida as well, the Florida Agricultural Mechanical University, FAMU. And um, we have Extension offices in all 67 counties in the state. And we try to take the information, the research that's conducted at the university level and, and bring it down to our communities and kind of make it digestible and accessible and relevant to their daily lives with our main mission being to enhance the quality of human life for everyone within our community. Um, so, you know, in uh, trying to accomplish this mission, we really reach into a lot of different areas um, of uh, people's lives and into the community. We have folks in the office that are experts in marine fisheries and coastal restoration. We have livestock um, experts. We have folks that are experts in the commercial horticulture field. We um, provide a lot of value to our community in um, the uh, new licenses and CEUs for pesticide license holders. So folks that work in the landscape industry and have to apply pesticides and um, fertilizers. They go through um, training programs that are facilitated by us. Um, so you can see here in 2019, we had over $2 million in the value of new licenses and CEUs. Um, we have a robust volunteer program in the Master Gardener volunteer program. We have actually over 109, about 109 active uh, Master Gardener volunteers right now. And they donate about 10,000 hours of their time annually uh, preparing and presenting different kinds of educational opportunities to the community. So uh, with that and with our 4-H volunteer program, you know, we can, we can attribute about $860,000 in, in value to that time. Uh, we also, uh, through the 4-H program and support of our local FFA programs and, and other types of youth organizations, we educate over 28,000 youth every Every year um, or in, in 2019, but that's uh, pretty close to average. And then over uh, 14 million gallons of water saved to Manatee County Utilities customers. And that's mainly through our mobile irrigation lab program, the water conservation program um, that involves actually landscape um, irrigation rebates. So if you're interested in any of these programs, you know, reach out to us here at Extension. We're here to help you, to serve you. Um, you know, this is really just the tip of the iceberg on what we do. We also have a food and nutrition program that's in um, most of the Title uh, Title I schools in the community offering food and nutrition assistance. Um, we have the Master Money Mentors program. We have all kinds of really exciting programs that, that we offer. And again, these are all based on research that's conducted at the university level and made accessible to folks in our community. And so um, if you don't know who we are, I hope you will uh, utilize us in the future. After hearing this presentation, I'll go ahead and let Amy Stripe, who is one of our Master Gardener volunteers, share her screen and she will get started talking to you about palm diseases today. Thank you, Alyssa, and hello, everybody. Welcome. Thanks. This is the uh, this is part three of our webinar trilogy on palms, and um, today we're going to discuss uh, diseases, disorders, and insect pests of palms, plus goofy things that uh, palm things that are normal. Uh, part one was a couple of weeks ago. We discussed uh, palm biology and ID. Part two was last week. We discussed palm care, which included. Uh, transplanting palms, fertilizing, and pruning palms. So today we're going to get uh, we're going to talk about diseases and disorders. I am indebted to these three University of Florida scientists for their research, their publications, their presentations for the material that I'm going to be presenting today. 
So as we discuss manifestations of problems on palms, we make a distinction between symptoms and signs. So symptoms are how a plant expresses the presence of a disease, disorder, or pest. So for example, wilting leaves, that would be considered a symptom. Um, a sign is actually physical evidence of the disease, disorder, or pest. So that an example of that would be like the presence of fungal spores. Um, to give you a human analogy, I suppose, if you have a sore throat, that would be a symptom. Um, and then the sign of, of would be something like if you've got a, a strep culture and, they, and the bacteria was present, um, that would be definitely a sign. I'm gonna use a key here today in discussing these diseases and disorders and pest problems. Um, if you see a skull and crossbones on a black border, that means it's a goner, that's a fatal situation, no cure. If you see a skull and crossbones on a gray background, that means strongly consider the possibility that it will be fatal. In other words, it's lethal, it's capable of killing. So we're going to uh, cover six diseases here today. These are the ones that we're seeing, at least here in Manatee County, um, most commonly on our, on our landscape palms. Now, palm pathogens and plant pathogens, for that matter, uh, come in four flavors, uh, from largest to smallest, uh, beginning with fungi, then bacteria, viruses, and viroids. Now, palm viruses and viroids are, uh, there are diseases caused by those, but they're very, very, very rare in Florida. So we're just going to concentrate on diseases that are caused by fungi and bacteria. Um, fungi is, again, the largest pathogen there is, and you can probably see quite a few fungal fruiting bodies with your naked eye. Um, you might need a hand lens to see the fungus itself but all the rest of the chaps on this list require microscopes. Um, there are instances in which um, fungi and bacteria are not culturable. Usually most of them you can culture in an artificial media, media but you cannot, uh, there are a couple really interesting ones, key ones we're gonna talk about today that cannot be cultured artificially. Um, and one of those is a bacteria, type of bacteria called a phytoplasma. Those are bacteria without cell walls. They cannot exist outside of a living host, in this case, a plant or a pest insect. And so this is a, a, an example of a bacteria that you cannot culture artificially. You have to study it at the molecular level, um, DNA and things like that. Okay, so we're gonna start with a fairly innocuous, at least in the home landscape, a fairly innocuous, a fungal disease, leaf spots and blights. There are a number of fungal pathogens that can cause these, uh, Phytophthora, Filobiopsis, et cetera. Um, but you, it normally will start, you see this picture over here on the far left, it can start as a sort of a water soaked lesion, uh, brown, black, maybe surrounded by uh, a halo of some other color, uh, maybe yellow sometimes. And then it can progress, as it progresses, uh, it can cause leaf blight. That's this large areas of necrotic tissue. Now this um, example on the far right, that is actually a fungal disease called uh, uh, graffiola leaf spot. It is very common on palms. Um, it is, it, it's really a cool one because you can actually feel it. it it's a little raised bumps on the, leaf, on the older leaves. And sometimes you might see a little white filament like this sticking out of it. That, that's the fruiting body. Now, just to point out this spot here, that spot there, there's a couple of other kind of weird looking spots on here. Those are actually a potassium deficiency. That is not fungal. And the main way to distinguish fungus from, um, from a nutritional deficiency is if you uh, remember last week, we talked about nutritional deficiencies. They are very specifically located within the canopy. Um, fungal issues will affect, generally speaking, the entire canopy. Okay, so leaf spots and blights are really more of a, of a concern in a, in a nursery setting where you're growing um, uh, palms in containers, especially with young palms because they haven't developed a trunk yet. So their foliage is kind of close to the ground or maybe even touching the ground, which is where they're acquiring the, the, the pathogen. So uh, management of leaf spots and blights would be to eliminate overhead ir irrigation of young palms, protect them from injury, ensure good palm nutrition, 
You may want to remove infected leaves, but only do so if there are no nutritional deficiencies evident. As we learned last week, palms store their nutrients in their leaves. Okay, fungicides may help, but you need to identify the pathogen. You need to, in order to know what kind of product to buy, to apply, you need to be able to identify that pathogen, um, which requires lab testing. Um, now, the other thing to keep in mind with fungicides is they're never gonna cure uh, spots that are already on the, on, the, on the palm, on the leaves. Okay, we're gonna skip now to a real big baddie. This is lethal bronzing disease. You see my skull and crossbone there on a black background. This is a fatal disease, no cure. And it's been in the press a lot lately, um, at least here in Manatee County. We've been under enormous pressure with this disease. Um, we're seeing it uh, increasingly on particular species of palms, but it is a fairly widespread. Uh, lethal bronzing disease obstructs the phloem. That's the vascular uh, system that carries carbohydrates or sugars in palms. Uh, it is caused by that phytoplasma, that's that bacterium without a cell wall, so it does not persist outside of a live host. It first appeared here in Florida in 2006. It has been documented in 31 Florida counties, uh, principally uh, Central Florida and South Florida at this juncture, and it is vectored or carried by the American palm cichlid. This is him here, that's Haplaxius crudus. He is a plant hopper a piercing sucking insect. He basically sucks plant juices out of leaves. Um, the progression of this disease is, is fairly fast. It varies by palm species, but three to eight months is about the general, the general um, decline. So the known host range for uh, lethal bronzing disease is 16 species so far. Uh, 13 are in the US. Uh, there are three have been documented in Mexico. So this includes the Christmas palm, Bismarck, Pendo, Carpentaria, coconut palm, Chinese fan, and then four date palms, the Canary Island date, the Medjool date, the Pygmy date, and the wild date palm, the cabbage palm under heavy, heavy duty pressure from this disease, queen palm, and the windmill palm. Now you'll notice that there are footnotes associated with the Bismarck and the Chinese fan palm. And what that refers to is that Dr. Bader has only documented ever one individual case uh, of lethal bronzing disease in these two species. And he has in fact seen uh, Bismarck's and Chinese fan palms in nursery settings where the Haplaxis crudus is just all over the place, um, the, where he, the insect is present in large quantities, where other uh, palms have died or are diseased with lethal bronzing and they've been fine. So it, this might be a fluke of sampling or testing. We don't really know at this point, but just be, be aware of that. This list, by the way, is likely to increase as the, um, the penetration of this disease, especially in South Florida, uh, goes on because South Florida has, of course, many, many more palm species than we do in Central and North Florida, simply because of the warmer, the warmer climate. So regardless of the species, the progression of lethal bronzing is exactly the same. It starts with the death of the flowers and premature fruit drop, um, assuming that it's in flower or fruit. And then that is followed by the oldest foliage turning reddish brown, beginning at the leaf tips, very similar to a disease we're gonna discuss in a minute called Ganoderma butt rot. Uh, then 25 to 50% of the old foliage is dead. And at that point, the death of the spear leaf. The spear leaf is the newest unopened um, uh, leaf in the canopy, unfurled. Now the sign of lethal bronzing disease is if you can, if you push against the, the, the trunk or the stem and it easily rocks back and forth, that is a sign that there is, uh, the roots near the surface are decaying. Now the death of the spear leaf in lethal bronzing occurs much faster than in fungal diseases. So here you see more, ne more necrotic older leaves than normal as long as nobody removes them you know, removing dead and dying fronds does take symptoms away and it makes your job tougher. But you can see the close-up of this tree here, here's the close-up, there is the spear leaf and it is dead. This is a cabbage palm. Look at that distinctive bronze coloration of the, that old, that, those old dead leaves. And here's your spear leaf right there, dead. Now look at this other, some of the newer leaves are still green. So this is a real characteristic 
way to identify lethal bronzing disease is if you have still some new green leaves, but the spear is dead. Here is just to give you some more examples of lethal bronzing disease on uh, cabbage palms. Um, this is, uh, and some of these are in undisturbed areas, some of these are in landscapes. This is the final stage uh, where the canopy has really fallen off at this, at this juncture. And this is what Dr. Bader calls the woodpecker phase, which I guess it's because it looks like a telephone pole. So there is a very narrow window now in which to remove a palm from your landscape if it has lethal bronzing disease in order to prevent the spread of it to other palms in your landscape. What Dr. Bader and his team discovered is that um, the spear leaf or the newest unopened leaf or leaves on the palm is where the insect acquires lethal bronzing disease. In other words, Hyplaxis crudus comes along, um, chomps on a spear leaf, and if it is infected with lethal bronzing disease, he can then spread that by chomping on the foliage of other, of other uh, palms. So removal of an infected palm if the spear leaf is still alive may help prevent the spread of that. Um, now there is a, a preventative injection of oxytetracycline. It's an antibiotic. Uh, the, the, the gentleman at the, in the top two photos there is, is in, in the process of drilling a hole and then injecting OTC. It is not a cure and it is strictly preventative. You have to have a palm that has uh, no sign of lethal bronzing disease for this to be effective. Keep in mind for the life of the palm, you have to persist with these injections every four months. Um, then good hygiene just dictates that if you have healthy palm, uh, palms, or I should say asymptomatic palms with no symptoms, living in the same landscape as palms that have symptoms of lethal bronzing disease, it's a good idea to take a trunk tissue test um, for lethal bronzing, because if they, are, if they are asymptomatic, they test positive for lethal bronzing, you want to get it out of the landscape. If they test negative for lethal bronzing disease, uh, you can, you can take the step of, of the OTC injections. But again, you know, it, that's a personal decision, economic decision, um, and the OTC really is something that, you know, you would probably only do for a high value palm. All right, Fusarium wilt, there's your uh, skull and crossbones again on a black background. This is a, a, fatal, uh, a fatal disease. It's caused by a fungal pathogen. Um, the only good news, I guess, about Fusarium wilt is that it is very, very, very host specific, only three species of palms, the Canary Island date palm, the Mexican fan palm, and the queen palm. Okay, you guys are gonna hear me say Canary Island date palm about a million times in today's talk. Canary Island date palms are my poster child of palm problems. They just seem to have all the problems out there that are available on any palm tree. They're going to get it. Anyway, um, what, Fus what Fusarium will does is it, it interferes with the, um, the xylem, which is the, the vascular tissue that carries water in the palm. So that's why you get kind of this desiccated you know, look on the, on the palm leaves. Now, just um, just because we're going to be talking about this a lot, I just want to review here that this is a feather type of palm. It's a pinnate leaf. Um, this is called the center midrib is called a rachis, and these are leaflets. This is a fan palm or palmate or costa palmate uh, type of leaf. This is called a petiole, and these are called segments. All right, so Fusarium wilt is, is, is there are two, it comes in two flavors uh, in Florida. The first one is Oxys, uh, Fusarium oxysporum cariensis. That is the Fusarium wilt of Canary Island date palm. It is spread by fours because it is a fungus, but in Canary Island date palms, it's usually spread on pruning tools. The death is anywhere from six to 18 months on, on this one. The second flavor of Fusarium wilt is Fusarium oxysporum palmarum, and that is the one that kills queen and Mexican fan palms. And that, in their case, it's usually spread uh, by, by the wind, by spores, much more virulent, uh, death within two to three months, super, super fast. By the way, there's another um, 
there's another uh, fusarium that affects oil palms, but that's a thing for Africa, not for us. Okay, so usually, but not always, not always, we will, you will observe one-sided death of the leaflets. Uh, very, very distinctive, but you don't always see that. What you always will see is this, this reddish brown stripe here on the rachis, in this case, or petiole, if this were a fan palm. And then you always see this, this uh, corresponding kind of cross, you know, discolored cross section here. This is inside of the petiole, or I mean inside of the, uh, the rachis. So here again, you see that very, very distinctive stripe. And then you can see where it's on the inside, it's discolored. This is showing the one-sided death of the leaflets. This is on a queen palm. And this is showing what it looks like on a, a Mexican fan palm. Now, um, notice how you have green segments, then it's starting to get chlorotic, which is yellow, and then necrotic, basically death. The uh, disease moves from the oldest to the newest leaves. That's a very distinctive, uh, very distinctive characteristic of it. And uh, it looks kind of freeze dried when in death. Now, I'm always, this, this picture intrigues me. I don't know that third Canary Island date palm here. I don't know how he managed to dodge this bullet, but I'm guessing that either they pruned off a lot of dead leaves on this one, on these two, or they, they prune these within an inch of their life with uh, of live leaves and they probably spread the disease on pruning tools. Again, you get that freeze dried look um, of the canopy. These, this is a queen palm. And so the chronological progression of symptoms on Fusarium wilt is leaflets on the oldest live leaves may wilt on one side of the leaf. It spreads upward in the canopy. The spear leaf is the last to die. Remember in Ganoderma, or it's not Ganoderma, I'm sorry, in lethal bronzing disease, we said that the spear leaf dies fairly early on in the process. And then the canopy looks freeze dried in death. The signs are a one-sided death of the frond, distinct reddish brown discoloration of the petiole or rachis, discolored cross section of the petiole or rachis. And this is that uh, one example of a fungus that cannot be cultured. So management, once diagnosed, you wanna remove immediately because the spores are wind driven. Always sterilize pruning tools between palms and exclusion. Do not replant a host species in the same site. Fusarium can persist in the soil for 20 to 25 years. Um, so that's, that's the answer there to, to planting a, a palm in a, in where you removed a diseased one. Um, no fungicide recommendations at this point. Systemic fungicides usually accumulate in leaf tips and fusarium begins in the leaf bases. Now this is the benign cousin of fusarium wilt. Doesn't this look a lot like fusarium wilt? Um, this is a, a fungal disease caused by numerous kinds of pathogens called petiole or rachis blight, depending on the type of palm it's on. And uh, it's very easy to confuse with fusarium. But remember, fusarium is very host specific, three species only. So this is spread by spores. Just about all palms are susceptible. It is not usually fatal. And in the field, you cannot distinguish this from fusarium wilt. So you have to take an extra step to, uh, to, to diagnose ped petiole rachis blight. So you see initially, again, it looks just like um, you know, fusarium wilt. The, some of the leaf segments will turn yellow and die, but you do see that distinctive, you might be able not to see it too clearly in this picture, but there's that distinctive reddish brown stripe. And that discoloration, again, internal to the, um, to the petiole or the rachis. So the first thing you wanna do is eliminate fusarium. If it's not one of the three host species of fusarium, if it's not a queen palm, if it's not a Canary Island date palm, if it's not a Mexican fan palm, you know it's probably gonna be petiole or rachis blight. It's not fusarium. But of those three species, unhappily, Mexican fan palm is the most susceptible uh, to petiole or rachis blight. But you can induce sporulation by placing a discolored piece of that petiole in a plastic box with wet paper towels. And I'll show you a picture in a minute what that looks like. 
And then remember that fusarium is only identifiable by DNA or molecular analysis. So this picture on the right, that shows the spore producing structures visible on the petiole. I have a couple of Mexican fan palms in my landscape and um, I did look up one day and I saw that one-sided discoloration on the, uh, on the segments. And so when that leaf fell, um, I took the piece of that petiole, I put it in a box with a piece of paper, wet paper towel in a plastic box. And sure enough, within about three or four days, I had spore producing structures. So I was like, dodge that bullet. It's not fusarium because fusarium cannot be cultured. Um, but it's one of those things that these are, these are pretty severely affected. On mine, it seems to come and go. Uh, it certainly in really wet weather is when I see it the most, like now. So you can cut off dead or dying leaves to prevent the spread of the spores, but this might weaken the tree. Again, you don't want to take off um, you know, things that are really green, still green, because of the nutrient problems we have with palms. And you want to ensure proper fertilization and water management, obviously don't overwater. Um, application of fungicides is iffy. Again, you have to uh, identify which specific pathogen it is in order to know what product to use, and then it will not cure already damaged leaves. Okay, this is Thelobiopsis trunk rot. This is a skull and crossbones on black. So that tells you that this is a fatal situation in palms. This is a fungus a type of fungus, the Thelobiopsis is a type of fungus that invades trunk wounds. Now notice where the failure is occurring on these two palms. It's occurring well up there, well up on the stem or the trunk, uh, sort of up, at the t up, up near the top of the, where the canopy is. So um, this uh, Thelobiopsis trunk rot causes decay of soft trunk tissue. There are no reliable symptoms for this. It may have premature death of oldest leaves. You may see bleeding on the trunk uh, with possible odor of fermentation. Uh, the tissue around bleeding areas may be soft until the sudden collapse of the trunk or can sudden collapse of the trunk or the canopy falls off. Um, this is a pretty dangerous situation right here. So what happens in thelobiopsis is that the disease rots all but lignified trunk tissue. Lignified tissue is very, very fibrous. So therefore it affects the very top half of the trunk. That's the youngest part of the stem where there's less lignin. All palms are susceptible. The time from infection to death is not known because of the unreliability of symptoms. And a definite sign is rot on one side of the trunk, which you can only see once you've cut the palm down and you've dissected it or you've done a cross section of that trunk. Um, the, uh, you know, the fungus invades the trunk via, via wounds and they can be anything from man-made or mother nature. It could be, um, you know, it could be birds or insects or, you know, trunk cracks because of overwatering or too much rain. Uh, but it could be climbing spikes, it could be nails, um, a very common Thing that happens is in nurseries, they stake, uh, sometimes they stake palms and they put um, the metal band right up against the stem or trunk. And if that damages the trunk, obviously we know no wounds ever heal on palms, on palm trunks. So that's a very common source of uh, um, a reason why thelobiopsis occurs. So this is the, that trunk rot. So this is, you know, obviously you've cut down the palm at this stage, but you can see the picture on the left. You can see the rot is only on one side of that cross section of that trunk. It is moving from the outside inwards in the top half of the trunk. Ganoderma, which we're gonna discuss in a minute, rots the lower four to five feet of trunk from the soil line up and moves from the center of the trunk to the outside. Um, so you might want to check areas that are bleeding. If there's bleeding areas, if you push it hard with your fingers and it's soft, um, you might want to take a screwdriver and jam it in there to determine how far that rod extends into the trunk. Um, you know, you're creating a wound there, but probably it's a goner anyway. Uh, so again, the, the, you're looking for trunk wounds where, you know, fungus enters the trunk. And then this shows you that this is the only the lignin, the, the fibrous, tissue remains. The rest of the trunk tissue has degraded. 
So the chronological progress, progress, progression of the symptoms is you may see the reddish brown to black bleed on the trunk, possible odor of fermentation and soft tissue around wounds. You may have premature death of the oldest leaves and they'll just, they'll just cling on there, they'll just hang down. And then basically the canopy suddenly falls off and collapses within the upper third of the trunk. So these signs are basically rot on one side of the trunk and presence of a trunk wound. You wanna remove wounded or collapsed palm immediately um, because fetal biopsis is soil borne, it will persist. Disinfect tools between palms. You can replant palms in the same location as long as you can protect them from getting wounded. That's not always possible. And then you wanna keep the tops of new palms from contact with the soil. Okay, this is our last disease we're gonna talk about today. Oh, I did wanna say one other thing, sorry, sorry. On thelobiopsis. Thelobiopsis normally occurs on um, fresh trunk wounds. So if you've got an old wound on a trunk, uh, and you have not seen any signs of thelobiopsis, it probably will not happen. Usually it's on, like I said, very recent trunk wounds. Sorry about that, skipping back. Okay, Ganoderma butt rot. Ganoderma is a really wide uh, spread genus of fungus. And uh, the one that, that uh, gets to palms is called Ganoderma zonatum. It affects palms at only palms. And it's got a skull and crossbones here on a gray background because uh, whilst it, all, it almost always kills the palm, it doesn't always kill the palm. So, you know, you're, I don't know what the odds are exactly, but, but scientists have seen uh, palms survive with this for, you know, months, even years. So this is a native, a native fungus, again, a dermazonatum. It affects only palms, but it affects all palms. Uh, Dr. Elliot calls this the game changer. And what she means by that is people are gonna stop wanting to plant palms because of Ganoderma. It, 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 you know, you don't, no palm is immune to it. It is spread by spores and it is um, soil borne. Uh, it does, um, by the way, it does colonize the lower part of the trunk of the, of the palm, both living and dead, uh, as well as the roots of palms. And, uh, but it may take months or years, may pass before the death of the palm, if at all. The symptoms are quite cryptic, as we say. Now, there are some especially susceptible palms, the Eureka palm, the Perotus palm, queen palm, and there it is, Canary Island date palm. Um, the Eureka and Perotus palms are actually clumping palms. They have multiple, multiple stems or trunks. And what happens is people in the landscape try to keep them tidy, and sometimes they do so by thinning out those multiple trunks while well, leaving trunk stumps is a perfect perfect environment for Ganoderma to colonize so that's why we think we're seeing this commonly on Arecus and Perotus. Uh, again the disease occurs in the lower three to five feet four to five feet of the trunk that's why it's called butt rot. It can resemble lethal bronzing disease and how it affects the foliage there's only two surefire ways to diagnose it. That's the emergence of this mushroom-like structure, we call them a conch, in the lower trunk. That occurs only in about 50% of the cases in Florida. Now, frequently in Manatee County, we, we see it, but overall in Florida, only about 50% of the time. And then the other way to diagnose is a cross-section of the lower trunk tissue. Of course, by this time, you've cut it down, um, displaying rot. So this is the uh, basidiocarp, the conch that is growing it, it's like a it's like a it's almost like a shelf it doesn't have a, a like a little stem on it it looks it's a mushroom without a stem um, this one has not released its spores yet it's still white on the underside if you see this on your palm remove it dispose of it carefully put it in a plastic bag wrap it up real good um, but i can tell you that this will not prevent uh, this will not help your palm it'll just help it from spreading it to other palms um, this is the disease coming out of the out of the trunk, not trying to get in. You might see something that looks like this. This is multiples on the trunk of a palm. Once they've released their spores, they turn a dark kind of caramel color, brown, brownish color. 
um, they don't look nearly as pretty as this. And then this shows you the cross section of the trunk. So up here, this is the lowest part of the of the stem or trunk of the of the uh, of the palm that's been removed, that's been cut down, and this is our progression up the stem or trunk of the palm. Uh, once the rot has, um, once about 75 to 80 percent of the of the of the of the uh, trunk has been rotted across, that's when it dies. That's when the, the palm usually dies. Now you'll see more dead lower leaves than normal, but doesn't this look like lethal bronzing, right? And then you might see mild to severe wilt. Uh, definitely you'll have an unstable palm trunk because it's rotting down there at the base, the lower part of the, of the trunk or stem. And then the chronological pro progression of this, of this guy is more dead leaves than normal, lower leaves than normal, the wilting or desiccation of all leaves except the spear leaf. And then you'll see the signs are the formation of those mushroom-like conchs and the internal discoloration at the lower trunk as it progresses. No cure. Uh, no, we don't know the environmental factors that are conducive to, uh, for the spread of this, uh, of this fungus. And um, really, it's present in rotting trunks, as I said earlier, and roots, but it does not rot the roots. Um, it is not spread by pruning tools because the butt rot never reaches the canopy. It's, it's confined down to the lower part of the trunk where you're not doing any pruning. You want to remove the palm and its roots as soon as the conchs are spotted because if it's a very tall or big palm, it will become unstable. And you do not want to plant another palm in its place. Um, now, having said that, <laughs> again, scientists have observed cases where uh, palm trees have been planted where a Ganoderma victim has been removed and nothing has happened. They've also seen palms live in areas where they have visible conchs and survive. So it's, it's, a, pretty, um, it's a pretty strange, strange um, disease. But the university is recommending that you get it out of the landscape as soon as you can positively diagnose it with those conchs. You don't want it spreading to other, other uh, palms in the neighborhood or your, your yard. So the big bad three in terms of the diseases are Fusarium wilt. Now that is again, very host specific, three species only, Canary Island date, queen palm, and Mexican fan palm. Lethal bronzing, which is somewhat host specific. I mean, we're up to 16 species, or yeah, 16 species now. And then Ganoderma butt rot, all palms are susceptible. So these three are largely unpreventable. Um, I do have a little footnote there. You can, you can possibly inoculate for lethal bronzing disease so long as the palm is healthy. Um, so does that mean exclusion? You know, does that mean you're not going to plant any palms? That's what Dr. Elliot is fearing is going to be the case. Now, notice I don't have Thelobiopsis as one of the big bad three because technically trunk wounds are preventable. Um, you know, not certainly by a human intervention uh, preventable. But that's the, um, that's the disease landscape. There are other diseases, but these are again, the most common ones we're seeing um, in the landscape. So pest insects now. Um, luckily, most, uh, many, I should say, many of the, the, uh, the pest insect problems we've had on palms are being taken care of by, by predatory insects, by biologicals. Um, I'm thinking specifically of that Rugros spiraling whitefly. We had a real terrible, terrible time with that about eight to 10 years ago on coconuts. And luckily along came the Incarcia wasp and uh, it preys on uh, spiraling whitefly. So we haven't really seen that in uh, recent years. I'm sure we'll have another outbreak again. To, you know, diseases and pests never go away, but um, for now we don't have that. So I'm gonna talk about two uh, insects. This is the palmetto weevil. Notice my skull and crossbones on a black background, again, fatal. This is a uh, right, right, Rhincophorus craniatatus verbiceus. What a great name for this guy. Um, the the a, a weevil, by the way, is basically a, a beetle with a with a snout, and it's got these really fierce mandibles on there to dig into plant tissue for laying for laying eggs. So this weevil responds to chemical uh, chemicals released by stressed palms, and then they proceed to lay eggs in the bud. The the meristem, you know, the heart of the, of the palm, and then their larvae eat away, eat it away, and kill it. 
Um, the palm canopy usually topples over and that's usually the first symptom you have that you have an infestation of palmetto weevils. So look at these two collapsed canopies. The one, the one on the left is the uh, Canary Island date palm. And note that the lower fronds are drooping, but they're still green. Now the, the new growth at the top is pretty much totally uh, uh, chlorotic and on its way to death. Uh, now the picture on the, on the right is a cabbage palm. And there you can see that just the whole crown has collapsed. I'm not surprised. Look at the pruning that's been done on everybody in this picture. So this was one stress puppy, and of course that attracted the palmetto weevil. Uh, the adults will vary in size and coloration. Um, the, the larva, as big as my thumb, huge, gross looking. Um, they munch away. They're the ones that do the damage, obviously. And um, you know, as many as 200 larvae have been extracted uh, from mature crowns of palms. Now, here's a funny story. You can actually, if, you, if, you, if your palm canopy is low enough to the ground, uh, you can take a stethoscope and put it up against there and you can actually hear them munching away. Quite something to see, or hear, rather. So they're cryptic feeders. Again, they're undetectable until your canopy collapses. A very fast progression, usually three months from infestation to death. Um, susceptible spe species, there he is again, the Canary Island date palm. And then there's the medjool date palm, the uh, saw palmetto, the cabbage palm, the sable palmetto, thrineck species, those are thatch palms, the Bismarck, Lantania, the royal palm, and the coconut palm. Now, the name palmetto weevil comes from the fact that it occurs in the, in the you know, in, in undisturbed areas on the saw palmetto. Um, in fact, it probably in undisturbed areas only occurs on saw palmetto, no other palm. It's only in landscapes that we're seeing it on these other species. And the reason why the saw palmetto can kind of survive this guy is because it's a clumper. And so if one of the stems or, or trunks dies or, you know, canopies dies, it has other, other stems within, its, within the plant to survive it. Um, so stress palms are most vulnerable, ones that have cold damage, over pruned ones, uh, sometimes newly transplanted palms, nutritionally deficient palms, obviously, but there, can, there are some notable exceptions. The Bismarck, the Canary Island date palm, and the Lantania species of palms can be hit at any time. We don't know why that is. Um, if I had to speculate, I would say that those are very large trunked palms. They have a very, very big trunk. They have a very big apical meristem. So if I'm Mrs. Palmetto Weevil, I want to make sure that I'm going to have plenty of food for my, my larva. So I hit the big boys there. I hit the, the big, bigger palms. Not to mention more expensive, right? <laughs> so um, uh, the chronological progression is young leaves start to die on your on your Phoenix canariensis, your canarium date palm, the oldest leaves will droop but remain green. The top of the palm will collapse. And really the only sign you're gonna ha really have definitive physical evidence is to examine the palm heart and you may see larvae, adults, and cocoons all at the same time. Charming, isn't it? Uh, to, to manage it, we wanna obviously keep your palms healthy. For expensive palms, you know, high value palms, you might consider the application of systemic pesticides like imidacloprid. Systemic pesticides are ones that target piercing, sucking insects, insects that feed on or munch on uh, your palms. Uh, if you're worried about pollinators and imidacloprid or systemics, a uh, simple way around that is when that, palm, uh, when that palm flowers, remove the flower stalk immediately, and that way you remove the possibility of a, a pollinator uh, getting involved with uh, with your systemic. You can put a new palm in place of a dead one as long as it's healthy, of course. The adults aren't going to hang around without a food source for their offspring. Okay, this is the second and last insect pest. This is the palm leaf skeletonizer. Um, this picture on the right, this is the excrement or frass of the larvae and, and they're underneath that. So they're kind of hiding themselves there. Um, it is a native moth. It lays eggs on the surface of the oldest palm leaves and then the larva mine 
both the upper and lower surface of the leaves, leading loads of excrement deposits and the skeletal look, this kind of bare bones look um, that's remained. By the way, the frass has been removed from these, from these uh, palms, so you can see the damage that they've done. This is very common. This is a very common site. It's a very close up of a, this is a, a fan palm and this is where the petiole comes into the blade or the leaf here, or the blade of the palm. And this is a very, very common view of, of the frass of the, of the skeletonizer. Um, most susceptible palm species appear to be Canary Island date palm, uh, the coconut palm, the, the uh, cabbage palm, lantanias, and then of course your Mexican fan palm. Um, luckily, there are several natural predators. It's mainly an aesthetic issue. It will not kill your palm. I, long, long ago, I had a, a customer who came into the uh, plant clinic at Extension with palm leaf skeletonizer on his uh, Canary Island date palm. And so I said, you know what, really, why don't you just hit it with a, a strong you know, stream of water from a garden hose? Because his canopy, it was still a young tree, so he could reach his canopy. Or his, his crown. Well, what he did instead was he cut off every single leaflet that had frass on it, and then about uh, two months later, it died. The tree died. The palm died. So don't do that. Try just try the water. <laughs> okay. Uh, physiological issues. I'm looking at our time here. We got about 15 minutes to go. Okay. Power line decline. This is very, very, very common. Um, for reasons unknown, palm trees in the vicinity of high voltage power lines will sometimes show goofy symptoms in the canopy, um, dead and necrotic or necrotic or, or, or chlorotic leaf tips and leaflets. Um, these five pictures I took in my neighborhood. I'm not a great photographer, obviously, but you can clearly see there's the power line going right by those Bismarcks. This is the power line coming right here by this cabbage palm, power line there. Power line, this is a royal palm. Look at the power line right here. This is a queen palm. And you can barely see, no, you can see this is a power line right here going through another royal palm. So the, it's palms within a few feet of high voltage power lines are affected. So you get this leaf tip necrosis or necrosis. The entire canopy may be affected. Sometimes the canopy, part of the canopy that's away from the power line gets affected, not the one that's closer to the power line. It's just kind of, uh, kind of hit or miss. Uh, palms are affected when broadleaf trees are not. We don't know why. And most species are susceptible. Death is quite rare. It just aesthetically does not look good. So the moral of the story is do not plant palms under power lines if they're going to get tall. <laughs> Okay, lightning damage. Uh, notice I have a skull and crossbones there with a gray background. Um, lightning is pretty much almost, I always say this, almost always fatal, but sometimes not. Um, but you probably will, it would not be unexpected, let me put it that way, for it to, it to die. And lightning damage, uh, lightning happens a lot more frequently than, uh, than you think. We're living in a lightning capital here in Tampa Bay area, lightning capital of the United States. And um, it happens on tall palms, on short palms. It happens quite, quite frequently. And this is some of the damage that you see. You might see bleeding holes in the trunk. You might go, oh God, filoviopsis. But this just happens to be lightning. Um, and then you might get splitting of the trunk. You know, the lightning superheats any sort of, of the vascular tissue in there and it might cause ruptures in the stem or the trunk. You get these shot holes sometimes, pretty interesting looking. So tall palms are most susceptible, like I said, but shorter ones may be affected, usually fatal. Um, the death, death can be very quick, two to three days, but sometimes they might linger. The palm might linger up to six months. It's not never gonna be come back with a vigor, with any vigor, and it might eventually succumb. Okay, water stress. Um, sometimes you get these situations where you get um, like, like this, you know, kind of this wrinkly bit of contraction on the trunk or kind of these wrinkly bits here. In the case of these two uh, palms, you've got either they're planted too deep and the root system has been compromised so it cannot take up water, or there's actually a drought situation happening. Now, if, it, if it's a drought situation, the, these things can be corrected. Um, but if it's planted too deep, um, no, not so much. Now, this is excess uptake of water. This is where the, where the actual, the, the, um, the, 
pseudo bark is splitting here. It might even go as far deep as the uh, as the live tissue. That's not a good. That's not good news. Um, these situations don't seem to compromise the structural strength of the trunk or the stem of the palm. Um, they just again might look cosmetically uh, bad um, on the you know in your landscape. This is cold damage. So this is so there's actually three kinds of cold damage. There's chilling, frost, and freeze injuries. Now, of course, chilling injury kind of looks like this. It kind of looks like burnt bits on the leaflets. Um, when freeze injury in, injury happens, it's probably it, it results in death of leaves of, of leaves. Um, frost injury looks like uh, I couldn't find a picture. I, I think that's kind of weird, but I could not find a picture of frost damage. But what it looks like is um, sort of uh, necrotic or chlorotic bits throughout the canopy, especially those areas that were most exposed to the, um, to the cold. So chilling injury is basically cold sensitive palms above freezing. Frost injury is where the leaf tissue cools to 32 degrees uh, or less. Freeze injury is where the air and plant surface temperatures drop to 32 degrees or less. Now, interestingly, not every part of the palm is as cold sensitive as other parts. So if you start over here at the far left, the most cold sensitive part of a palm is going to be the flowers and fruit. The next most cold sensitive is going to be the base of the spear leaf, that's that newest unfurled leaf, and the roots. Less cold sensitive are mature leaves. Even less cold sensitive is the tip of the spear leaf. Isn't that wild? So the base is sensitive, but the tip not so much. And then the newly forming leaves inside of that bud, inside the bud of the palm, are even less cold sensitive. And the least cold sensitive part is the apical meristem. That's good news <laughs> because that is the heartbeat of the palm right there. So um, now the spear leaf can be killed because again, that the you know it, it can result in uh, enough damage that it will kill the spear leaf. Um, if it has and you give it a tug, you should pull out that spear leaf. Now this does not mean that the apical meristem is dead. Just because that spear leaf is gone does not mean you're going to have a dead palm. Uh, there are also some cold damage can be very cryptic. For example, you might have a trunk rot, um, which is a case where uh, the vascular system got so cold it is now dead and rotting. Um, you can see these two, this is a, this is a, a queen palm, this is a trunk rot due to cold damage. And in the case of this, uh, this palm here, the canopy has collapsed three months after that cold event. It has, the cold has compromised the structure of the, uh, of the trunk to the extent that it can no longer support the top of it. Um, the key with palms is patience. Damage will appear within a day or two on leaves, but a death of a spear leaf may take several weeks. And like I said, a dead spear leaf does not mean the meristem is dead. It may take you six to eight months to assess really the total damage that's happened on a palm. Uh, new leaves may emerge deformed, uh, but progressively newer leaves will be fine. So again, remember with cold damage that uh, it is, it is host specific. So you don't want to plant a palm uh, in an area that is not that, you know, where your cold hardness zone does not allow, it will not survive. I mean, it won't live or thrive, I should say. You know what I mean. <laughs> uh, this is a, just an example of a truncated leaf tip on the first new leaf of a Bismarck palm after a cold event. So this is the type of thing that you will see. And some people kind of freak out and go, my palm's dying or dead. No, just be patient, you know, just let it take its course. So do not remove dead or damaged leaves or leaf bases, the boots, until the chance for cold weather is passed. But if a spear leaf is, pulls out easily, do remove it. You don't want it sitting there, rotting away. It could set up a secondary bud rot. And then a bud drench with fungicide sometimes is recommended. I mean, um, there's not a lot of science on this, but uh, our, uh, you know, the, uh, Dr. Elliott says, yeah, you know, it's not, not a bad idea to try it uh, to, to prevent secondary bud rot. And then you want to continue applications of complete palm fertilizer. You know, potassium deficient palms are more affected by cold. All right, salt damage, this is after a hurricane on a royal palm. Nothing to do in this case, just wait out, wait it out for new growth to come in to look nice and healthy. Now, uh, 
salt injury due to flood due to flood flooding really needs does need to be addressed and you need to really leach that soil around those around that plant with uh, with fresh water if there has been some salt water um, flooding. So strangler fig, there is a again a skull and crossbones on the black background. Um, it is the strangler fig is a native that's ficus aurea. It starts as a parasitic epiphyte in the boot of say of cabbage palms. Eventually, the air roots reach the ground and it becomes its own tree. It engulfs its host quickly reaching six feet high, robs the host of sunlight, basically killing it. So you can see here, this is a, this is a cabbage palm, here's the boot, and here's a strangler fig starting. By the way, this picture was taken at Emerson Point after a prescribed fire, so that's why it looks kind of funky. Uh, here, up here, high up in the canopy, you can see the strangler fig. Here is an example. This is the host. It's dead. <laughs> this is the trunk of the strangler fig. This whole thing is the strangler fig. Look at this root. Isn't that wild? And this is a completely dead host here as well. You can't see it very well, but this whole thing is a strangler fig. And this was the dead host. Was the live host, now it's dead. <laughs> Okay, so obviously in the case of strangler figs, you see a strangler fig, remove it <laughs> before it gets out of hand. All right, so these are normal abnormalities in palms. We get calls and questions on these things all the time, um, starting with root problems. Those of you who, um, who attended our biology class know what this is. This is the root initiation zone on palms. These are, this is a mature palm. Those roots are growing ent enthusiastically, um, and it's just a case of, um, it's it's coming up. These are not. I'm sorry. These roots are not actively growing because they're not in the soil, but they will. Uh, you know, produce all these new roots. They attach to the vascular bundles of of uh, system in the palm trunk. Um, is perfectly normal on mature palms. Um, on phoenix, some phoenix palms, you see that area portion of the root issue initiation zone can go up several feet. I'm starting to lose it here. Okay, this is another case, root initiation zone, very enthusiastically grown away there, and it has actually split and spread the bark, that's the pseudo bark at the base of the trunk, perfectly normal, perfectly normal on, on certain species. Uh, okay, here's, a, here's the uh, Mexican fan palm. Uh, this does, these behave kind of interestingly, it, until it gets to maybe 10 to 15 Year, uh, years old, it usually hangs on to its dead leaves. It has a skirt of dead leaves here, but once it reaches that age, certain age, it starts shedding off boots and it starts shedding off leaves as well. And that's a perfectly normal thing. This it doesn't look nice, but it's just in the process of discarding boots there. Uh, we get this question a lot. How come some cabbage palms retain their boots and some don't? And these are obviously in a in an undeveloped area here. This looks like a golf course back here, but this is an undeveloped area. Uh, well, obviously these are all grown from seed. You know, they're all genetic individuals, so they may just be genetically programmed to shed boots or not. Um, sometimes when they get to be about five or six years old, they start shed, just start shedding boots. It's just normal for them to to behave uh, behave that way. Uh, you often might see this as well. Now this is a cabbage palm in which the boot is, is still on there. And this is the petiole. The petiole has, been, has, has remained behind because nobody is pruning the dead off of this. So in this case, the petiole has, has been retained on the leaf base here, but the leaf, the leaf blade is completely gone. Epiphytic ferns growing in boots, not a problem. You don't like it, remove it, but it doesn't do anything harmful to the palm. Um, trunk erosion, we don't know why this happens. It's very common, on, it's not uncommon on older trees. This is the, um, this is the pseudo bark, which is really basically dead tissue. This is the, uh, this is the cortical tissue, it's a soft tissue. Uh, this is not a trunk wound, it's just some erosion that's happened. It's not going into the live tissue of the stem or the trunk. So that's not a problem. Leaf problems, scurf on young pygmy date palm. This is, looks a lot like a scale insect problem. We don't know what scurf, what the purpose of it is, but it is 
common on, on younger leaves of, of the Phoenix Robolini. And as this leaf matures, sometimes those just flake off. We don't know the purpose of them, like I said. Um, this is scurf on a foxtail palm. It looks very scary, but it is not. It is perfectly normal. And then we have uh, another, another curious thing. This is called Romenta. It is on a pindo palm, these little bits of tissue here. Again, don't know the purpose it serves, but it's perfectly normal. Then we have last, or almost last, yeah, canopy problems. This one stumped me. Another master gardener brought this to me a couple of years ago, and I did not know what it was. But what happens is, this is a date palm. Their flower and fruit stalk is in the middle of their canopy or crown, and somebody has simply removed it and left this kind of gap. And then we have all over problems. You probably may recognize this is prescribed burn. I just showed a picture of that earlier, uh, prescribed fire, and um, this palm will survive that. But we get a lot of people that sometimes they're away for the, in, the, in, the summer, in, the, um, in the summer months and they come back and they go, oh my gosh, look what happened in Emerson Point. Well, this was a prescribed fire. All right, so, um, if you want to get more information or uh, on, on each one of these uh, problems, there is a publication for almost each and every one of these available on EDIS, uh, University of Florida's Electronic Data Information System. But there's a really cool Palm Problems key here. If you just Google, this stands for Fort Lauderdale Research and Education Center, UFL EDU Palm Problems key, you will get to this particular page. And it goes by this, I just, this is just a screen grab. This is for the leaves, but it, it talks about leaves, trunks, uh, roots, and then you can click on each one of the palm problem or symptom, and it will open up and it will give you a link. It will give you a description and or a picture and or a link to a publication pertaining to that. So that is um, what I have for today. So are there any questions? Oops, I can't hear you. You must be on mute. Sorry, I must have hit the button okay. twice. Um, feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box. Um, we have disabled the chat so far. I don't have anything other than thank yous in the Q&A. Um, if you do think of something that you'd like to have answered, feel free to email it. Um, and if you have questions about other issues in your landscape, you are always welcome to email them to manatee. Uh, mg at gmail.com and that comes to our master gardener plant clinic volunteers and we will route that appropriately and try to answer your question. Let's see if we've got anything in here. All right. Basically they're just telling you how wonderful you are, Amy. Oh my gosh. Well thank you very much. <laughs> sorry for the sorry for the verbal goof ups there a couple of times. <laughs> but thanks for joining today, folks. All right. Great. Thank you all. Have a nice day. Bye.